This week on The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. If the air, food, and water out of which our children's bodies are constructed are contaminated, we can't do our job as parents. If the day comes when I can be a better mother inside of jail than outside, I will be that mother. This week, it's Farewell Fossil Fuels with Sandra Steingraber and Bill McKibben on The Bioneers. In 1988, top NASA climatologist James Hansen testified before Congress as the Paul Revere of global warming. He urged immediate action to dodge the bullet of irreversible climate change caused by the bonfire of the fossil fuels. Hansen aimed to provoke a national response. He did, but it came from Exxon and the fossil fuel industrial complex, which spent the next 20 plus years waging the biggest and most expensive disinformation campaign in history. It was a catastrophic success, sowing doubt and delay. As a result, by 2012, climate disruption crash landed from the future into the present, wreaking havoc worldwide. Now what's called for is to fast forward the most complex and urgent transition in the history of human civilization, to power civilization on clean energy. The greatest obstacle is the fossil fuel industry and its capture of political systems. And forget peak oil. The predicament is there's plenty of oil for decades to come, and fracking has shuffled the deck by tapping previously inaccessible vast reserves of natural gas. Can this juggernaut be stopped? Some people say a countervailing national and global movement of unprecedented proportions has stepped up to the challenge. This is the new abolitionists, Farewell Fossil Fuels, with biologist and author Sandra Steingraber and author and activist Bill McKibben. I'm Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. Four years ago, I stood at the Bioneers podium and spoke as a cancer patient. I asked my audience to imagine a future in which the deliberate introduction of chemical carcinogens into our environment would be considered as unthinkable as the practice of slavery. I said that I was seeing the beginning of an environmental human rights movement for which the animating vision was emancipation from our economy's desperate dependency on fossil fuels, which were killing the planet via climate change and killing ourselves via toxic exposure. My talk today is a dispatch from the front lines of that ongoing movement. Award-winning author Sandra Steingraber's book, Living Downstream, an ecologist's personal investigation of cancer and the environment, recounts her odyssey as a cancer survivor, biologist, and mother-to-be. She traced her own illness to the toxic, industrialized Illinois Valley where she grew up. The journey led her to seek the abolition of the toxic fossil fuel industrial system that underpins modern civilization. It also led her to settle with her family in the healthy environment of rural Ithaca, New York. But there was something about her family's new home that they didn't know. Sandra Steingraber spoke at a Bioneers conference. I didn't know then, nor did my neighbors, that the bedrock under our feet contained a mother load of methane, the vaporous form of petroleum called natural gas. I didn't know that the world's largest, most powerful industry was coming after it, proposing to use our drinking water as the club to smash the shale apart. I hadn't yet heard the word fracking, which is quite possibly the world's ugliest gerund. 40% of the land in my county is now leased to the gas industry, some inside my own village. High volume slick water horizontal hydraulic fracking is not yet permitted in New York State, and yet 20 miles from my house along the west bank of Seneca Lake, an energy company has purchased depleted salt caverns and is repurposing them for the storage of fracked gas from Pennsylvania. Absent our intervention, we in the Finger Lakes region are to become a transportation and storage hub for methane and propane extracted throughout the Northeast, 
a transformation that will require the massive industrialization of our peaceful agrarian community by an accident-prone, carcinogen-dependent industry. Already there have been toxic leaks. Already compressor stations, flare stacks, pipeline construction. Already test wells, chemical storage depots, fleets of tanker trucks, radioactive drill cuttings heading for landfills. Already the farmers of heirloom organic wheat and the millers and bakers who depend on them cannot expand their operations to meet local demand for bread because the wheat fields are boxed in by land leased for drilling. So as a witness to all this change, I too am changed. What the frack, wondered the shell-shocked Sandra Steingraber in her community. The biologist decided to dig deeper to understand exactly what fracking encounters in the mysterious depths of the earth. Let me now take you down into the shale bedrock, a landscape that none of us has ever seen, but whose integrity is bound up with our own. Parts of many states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Maryland, Texas, Colorado, Arkansas, to name some, are underlain by a foundation that was previously the floor of an ancient ocean. The seafloor that I live above, the Marcellus Shale, is 400 million years old. Its rock is made from the pressed particles of silt that drifted down from eroding mountains, which also contributed to the seafloor a whole periodic chart of elements, uranium, barium, strontium, radium, mercury, arsenic, lead. The ocean above it was full of life, plankton, sea lilies, squid. But when these sea creatures died and sank to the bottom, they didn't decompose. Instead, the oxygen-poor water of 400 million years ago, their bodies transformed into gaseous bubbles of methane, which became trapped in the silt that over eons hardened into shale. This fizz of petrified bubbles is fracking's quarry. But this deep shale is not just a graveyard. It's alive today. It's a habitat. It's an ecosystem that supports communities of contemporary living organisms. The life inside the bedrock consists of simple organisms, but they can form complex colonies, sending nanowires out to the surrounding rocks to transfer electrons. In fact, geologists now suspect that the total biomass of life contained within deep geological strata exceeds that living here on Earth's sunlit surface. The biosphere then extends much farther into the dark, stony heart of the planet than any of us had ever fully appreciated. Ergo, deep life organisms almost certainly play a role in the global carbon cycle and may, in ways that we don't fully understand, help in stabilizing the Earth's climate. During fracking operations, these organisms will grow inside the pipes, interfering with the flow of gas. That's the reason powerful poisons called biocides are used in fracking fluid. And that's one reason fracking fluid is so toxic. You can think of fracking as a hostage exchange program. It buries a surface resource vital to life, fresh water, and brings to the surface poisonous substances that were once locked away in deep geological strata. Sandra Steingraber compares these vast, ancient underground ecosystems to geological coral reefs. Their role in the web of life, which we've barely begun to understand, is far more important than we ever imagined. I began to realize that these organisms, like all other organisms on the Earth, are altering the habitat to suit themselves, and they are the creator of the rock. They're changing the rock and they're creating it. So the biologic is the creator of the abiologics. So these rocks are being created and recreated by living things. It means the earth is alive and not in a sort of Gaia hypothesis alive, you know, not in a mother earth spiritual way, but there are metabolically active creatures eating and reproducing a mile below us if you live over top of shale. So just exactly what does fracking do to this critically important earth system and to us? It works like this. First, a drill bit opens a hole a mile deep, turns sideways, and then tunnels horizontally through the bedrock. The hole is lined with a casing of cement and steel. To initiate the fracturing process, explosives are sent down it. 
Then fresh water, millions of gallons per well, is injected under high pressure to further break up the shale and shoot acid, biocides, and sand grains deep into the cracks. The sand grains hold the stone doors ajar, and the gas, trapped for 400 million years, is now free to flow through the propped open fractures. Here are some possible health threats of fracking for us. It starts with a strip mining of sand in the Midwest, which turns the earth inside out and sends silica dust into the air. Silica dust is a known cause of lung cancer and silicosis. Before it is sent down the borehole, the fresh water used to fracture the bedrock is mixed with inherently toxic materials. These include known and suspected carcinogens, neurological toxicants, and chemicals linked to pregnancy loss. These chemicals can spill, and they do. At least 1,000 truck trips are required to frack a single well. These trucks, along with earth-moving equipment, compressors, and condensers, release or create soot, volatile organic compounds, and ozone. Exposure to this kind of air pollution has demonstrable links to asthma, stroke, heart attack, cancer, and preterm birth, the leading cause of disability in the United States. The best data we have suggests 7% of wells leak immediately. What percent leak after five years? after 20, after a century, is fracking laying time bombs under the earth? And who gets to decide? These are not mitigatable, resolvable problems. There is no technological fix for shattered shale or the migration of toxic chemicals through it. Ironically, natural gas was first embraced, even by environmental advocates, as a cleaner transition fossil fuel than climate-wrecking coal. As a result, coal is on the run because of the fracking boom and falling prices. But gas fracking is anything but clean, and it's deeply implicated in climate change. Within the next 20 years, nearly half the greenhouse gas load produced by the United States could come from these burgeoning natural gas operations. That is, unless those operations are shut down. Authors Sandra Steingraber and Bill McKibben write, speak, and organize persuasively about the urgent necessity of ending the reign of fossil fuels while transitioning the industry that profits from them to clean energy. When we return, these writers put their hearts, souls, and bodies on the line. This is The New Abolitionists, Farewell Fossil Fuels. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. To explore more Bioneers radio shows and video programming, please visit media.bioneers.org. Author and climate change activist Sandra Steingraber knows no one can run away from climate change. But when she moved from her toxic hometown in Illinois to what she mistakenly thought was a cleaner, safer community in upstate New York, she came face to face with a stark ethical and political crossroads. Last month, a man knocked on my door. He invited me to come with him the following morning. He and some other locals were going to be chaining themselves to the fence of the Seneca Lake facility. As they were being arrested, would I speak to the press about formaldehyde emissions from the compressor station? Formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen. Would I speak about the exemptions granted in 2005 from the Safe Drinking Water Act and key provisions of the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act? Because of them, chemicals used in drilling and fracking operations can be claimed as trade secrets. Public release of their identity is not mandated by federal right to know provisions which govern other industries. High volume, slick water, horizontal hydraulic fracturing could be considered a crime if the requirements of our federal laws applied, but they don't. Would I talk about that? I did. The next morning, 17 people blocked the gate, the oldest of which was 85. At age 53, I was one of the youngest. In the end, three people were arrested for trespassing, including a retired Methodist minister who loves to fish. 
Another of those arrested went to jail for 15 days. Her name is Susan Walker. She is a mother and a nurse, and she's my age. In 2011, Sandra Steingraber won the prestigious Heinz Award for her research and writing on environmental health. She donated the $100,000 cash prize to create a fracking abolitionist movement across the state of New York. Her passionate leadership crystallized a coalition of nearly 200 groups and 1,000 businesses. More than 60 organizations have signed Steingraber's Don't Frack New York pledge. Along with thousands of individuals, they pledged to engage in nonviolent acts of protest and delivered the pledge to Governor Andrew Cuomo on August 27, 2012. But they didn't stop there. So towns and villages started asking themselves, couldn't we just zone it out? So our town board simply banned fracking. And a village town across the lake from us, a little town of Dryden, New York, followed in this. And they also banned fracking by sort of invoking their right to protect their citizenry from industrial practice they just didn't think was appropriate for the rest of the town because maybe they have a tourist economy. And in New York, where home rule has a time-honored value, that was respected, except that the gas industry cried foul. Because if there's a whole patchwork of towns, some saying yes and some saying no, and they have to unroll across the landscape this whole interconnected network, right? it only gets a gas, it all has to flow through one big spider web of a system, then that makes it kind of impossible for them to work. So the Anschutz company, owned by Philip Anschutz, sued the town of Dryden. It claimed that Dryden had no right to regulate the gas industry because only the state could do that. So the town was outside of its jurisdiction in banning fracking. My town across the lake held a fundraiser to help file an amicus brief in support of our sister town. We held it in the local pub, and we raised $24,000, which seems like a lot of money for a fundraiser in a village pub, in a village where like 1,200 people live, right? But then you turn around and you realize the guy who owns this company is, according to Fortune magazine, the 34th richest man in America, and he's got a worth of like $7 billion. And so you're imagining, you know, like these little towns, like the Tiananmen Square scene where we're standing against this line of tanks and you just wonder, how long is this going to hold? And a lot of people thought we were just throwing money down a rat hole. But we prevailed and it came to trial and the little village of Dryden won. We won, right? We can't tell the industry how to frack or to use a certain kind of well casing. That would be a regulatory decision that truly the state could only do. But we could say yay or nay to whether we wanted it or not, and so the judge upheld that. Of course, it was appealed, so we'll see. The little village of Dryden, New York, successfully banned fracking, and so did the city of Pittsburgh. It has outright banned fracking within the city limits, part of a growing national movement toward the abolition of fossil fuels to protect the climate, public health, and democracy. Another leader in the life-and-death battle to stop runaway climate chaos is award-winning author and journalist-turned-climate activist Bill McKibben. In 2009, McKibben and the organization 350.org he founded pulled off the largest-ever global rally to cut greenhouse gas emissions back to the safer level of 350 parts per million. On October 24th that year, there were 5,200 simultaneous demonstrations in 181 countries, exactly the kind of global grassroots climate action movement McKibben and his allies sought to create. In 2011, the battle escalated over the pending federal approval of the Keystone XL pipeline that would carry some of the dirtiest type of oil from the Canadian tar sands to the Gulf Coast for refining and global transport. To stop the approval, McKibben and 350.org led the largest U.S. civil disobedience action in decades. Nearly 10,000 protesters surrounded the White House, calling on the president to deny the pipeline permit. 
Bill McKibben. Jim Hansen at NASA said last year, burn that stuff in the tar sands on top of everything else we're burning, and it's game over for the climate. That is the second biggest pool of carbon on Earth. If we burned all the economically recoverable oil up there, we would burn more carbon than human civilization has yet burned. Um, so it's a big deal. And people responded. There were 1,253 of us who went to jail. It was the biggest civil disobedience action in 30 years in this country. And pretty soon, people were doing the same thing in Canada, and they were doing the same thing all over the world at consulates and embassies. And then we went back to the White House, and we circled it five deep with people standing shoulder to shoulder. And we weren't attacking. Every sign that was there was just a quote from President Obama in his 2008 campaign, you know, time to end the tyranny of oil. And four days later, the president said, okay, we'll take a year and study this harder. Now that's a temporary win. That's the only kind of win environmentalists ever get. And this one may be more temporary than most because the oil industry has fought back with everything that they have. They don't like to lose even a little bit. And it was really good to see that we could stand up to the fossil fuel industry when we came together. That though we lacked money, we could find other currencies, passion and spirit and creativity, that people were willing to spend their bodies too, you know, to make, that was really good to see. The tough part, of course, is in realizing that there are 50 other things like those tar sands around the world. And we cannot stop global warming in the time that physics and chemistry allow us one pipeline at a time, or one coal mine at a time, or one anything at a time. We need to go straight at that industry. We need to go straight at it as hard as we can. McKibben says he's out to break the radicalism of the fossil fuel industry before they break the planet. In 2012, 350.org launched a fossil fuel stock disinvestment campaign, beginning with colleges and universities. It's modeled on the successful economic boycotting of apartheid in South Africa. And time is of the essence when you do what McKibben calls global warming's terrifying new math. We know how much more carbon, roughly, we can put out into the atmosphere and have any hope of staying below 2 degrees. It's about 560 more gigatons, 560 more billion tons more. That sounds like a lot, but at the rate at which we're currently burning things, that'll give us about 15 years before we blow past that threshold. But that's not the scary number. A group of financial analysts in the UK added up how much carbon all the fossil fuel companies in the world had, and the number they came out with was about 2,800 gigatons in their reserves, okay? That coal and gas and oil is still below the ground, but economically, it's above the ground. It's what makes the share price for Exxon. When Peabody Coal goes to borrow money from the bank, it's what they use as collateral. So the time has come to take straight on that industry. That math makes clear that the fossil fuel industry, despite its riches, despite its power, is a rogue industry. It makes clear that they are outlaws, not against the laws of the state, because they get to write those, but outlaws, outlaws against the laws of physics. And that's a more serious, in the end, law to be violating. Four years ago, I stood on the stage and described the beginning of an environmental human rights movement. I thought then that it was my job to provide good science to its leadership. I thought it was not my job to tell you what to do. Today, I'm a fully-fledged member of the anti-fracking wing of this larger movement, and I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> Join us. I don't want to write words that fill jail cells, and yet it is my abiding responsibility to protect my children from harm and plan for their future, and my neighbors feel the same way. If the air, food, and water out of which our children's bodies are constructed are contaminated, we can't do our job as parents. If the day comes when I can be a better mother inside of jail than outside, I will be that mother.
And as fellow pledge signer Bill McGibbon reminds us, going to jail is not the end of the world. Only the end of the world is the end of the world. Sandra Steingraber and Bill McKibben, the new abolitionists. Farewell, fossil fuels. You can explore more Bioneers radio shows and video programming online at media.bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Catherine Stifter and Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Ryko Disc label. Additional music was made available by Jamie Sieber and Evan Schiller at jamiesieber.com and evanschillermusic.com. For more music information, please visit media.bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 213. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms, organic and family-owned since 1988. Visit organicvalley.coop. Mary's Gone Crackers, healing the planet through conscious eating, gluten-free and vegan products since 1999. Learn more at marysgonecrackers.com. John Masters Organics, feel good about looking good. Visit johnmasters.com. Funding also provided by a grant from the Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues, and by the generous support of listeners like you.